moving to Nietzsche. Friedrich. Friedrich Nietzsche. All right. We're reading Human All to Human. Or I'm reading. I'm look, I look like Jesus today, probably. All right, so we're going to read Friedrich Nietzsche, Human All to Human, a book for free spirits by Friedrich Nietzsche. R.J. Holdingdale is the translator. He's one of the best. He and Kaufman, uh, Walter Kaufman. All right, so this book, I'm going to explain a little bit about this. And um, Nietzsche actually, in the last one I read, Untimely Meditations, he was already kind of, he hesitated publishing the last one, you know, Richard Wagner in Beirut, because once that happened and all that stuff, he felt terrible about the whole thing, you know, um, the whole nationalistic stuff, anti-Semitism, all that stuff, he hated that. We can see this clearly in his no, uh, in his letters to his sister and so forth. He hated that relationship she had with the Fürstel, not the Nazi, anti-Semitic person. He even says, you know, I may even be a bad German, but at least I'm a good, you know, good European, he says. And that also corresponds to his philosophy about pan-Europeanism. Also, you know, the whole free spirit, enlightenment. So in this book, is increasingly um, hello uh, Julia uh, trans op operation is coming I'm I'm scared all right are you doing a trans operation yeah I don't, I don't have any experience with that uh, but yeah I can imagine All right, so Nietzsche today, all right, we're reading Nietzsche today. And um, so, so like I said, he's going increasingly against Wagner and his idols here, even Schopenhauer. Like I said, even when I read Untimely, but it's a little bit clearer to me now exactly where it happens and stuff like that. Uh, and, it, you know, we can already see it here, but he's going to increasingly do this, you know. And so in this book, it's going to be more the enlightenment, the naturalistic stuff like that. And also, it's the first time he's more this aphoristic, stylistic, you know, in terms of the style, in terms of what we usually think of Nietzsche in terms of style. This is where it kind of starts. Um, and yeah, uh, you got long hair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's actually not that long. I... I've had longer, but yeah, it's starting to get long. Um, so uh, yes, um, I'm gonna start reading this. So I don't know how far we'll get today with this because um, there is a preface here first. But so he's gonna talk about himself here a little bit. Preface. Uh, this book is actually like 400 pages, so. It's going to take a couple of streams, probably. But it depends on what we're going to, you know, dwell on. And how much on each, you know, aphoristic aphorism or, you know, it's a epigrams, aphorism, essays, kind of mini essays. All right. So, so we'll get to, this is like proper Nietzsche now, <laughs> basically. Well, it's, it's on, he's still, you know, developing his, his thing here. So you don't get, you know, the typical Nietzsche Nietzsche here, but, um, but yeah, you know, he had a painful life, you know, uh, bodily unhealth he was actually, he had migraines even as a child. Uh, this was just, uh, exacerbated later and between here, he also volunteered in the I think it was the Franco-Prussian War. He volunteered as a medical, uh, what should I call this? You know, like a medical, um, I think it says here actually, uh, by the translator. 
think it says here somewhere. Um, let me see here. Uh, collapse. Uh, it should say here somewhere. Yeah, he, he resigned. Exactly. He resigned from uh, Basel University. He was professor there. He was professor at 24, actually. Some people claim that he, he was 23, but he wasn't 23. He was an assistant professor as well. And then shortly he became a professor, so 24, 25 there. But still, he's very young, uh, even at the time, at the time, and even today. You know, that's almost, it almost never happens. Uh, so yeah, collection of aphorisms. This book wasn't popular. He wasn't popular until until um, this Danish uh, lecturer uh, talked about him. And it wasn't until it was too late, actually, until he, you know, lost his mind totally. The Zen, the Zen, uh, the Zen so he, so he probably caught some um, um, sicknesses here while, well, he hurt his rib as well from, from the horse in, in this war, uh, well, volunteering actually. Uh, well, I think that was kind of a little bit before that, or it was the same probably, but, um, but yeah, well, let's see here. Here, here we go. Franco-Prussian War. Uh, Europe was again at, at relative peace. It has been 10 years since the Austro-Prussian War that had left Prussia, uh, Prussia. Uh, dominant, or Prussian actually, Prussian, Prussia, Central Europe. It had been five years, it was dominant in Europe, uh, five years since the brief Franco-Prussian War, in which, yeah, the Franco-Prussian War, there Nietzsche briefly served as a volunteer medical orderly, with disastrous consequences for his health, which further enhanced and extended Prussia's sway, uh, this time at France, France expense, German unification of the Prussian leadership, the new Reich started with Otto von Bismarck. He he basically was against all this. Um, yeah, tech, new technologies, you know, all that stuff, you know, industrialism. He even had a typewriter, that's true, but he didn't like that new typewriter. You can actually find it on YouTube, this typewriter that Nietzsche, you know, used, but that's actually not the one he usually used because it was such a hassle to, to use, apparently. Um, Karl Marx and Freud wasn't, weren't influential yet. So, uh, human all to human, he is increasingly sick here. So he's leaving Basel University. He lives on a pension here and he's going around and trying to find better climate. Uh, so he goes to Switzerland, he goes to that's where he writes, actually not, that's not where, in, in, in Italy, in Rapolo and, you know, Portofino and, and places like that. Uh, well, around there, he walks around and this is where he writes a lot of the Das Buch Zarathustra as well. But this is before that, of course. Um, and so, so he kind of had to develop this way of writing because, because of these very difficult... Um, migraines and other other things here uh, let me just see if i can find what i was supposed to find here as well um the sickness stuff here uh, struggled let me see here um so that's the thing about the overcoming with nietzsche uh, he says it himself like I, I needed the most you know yeah and so no wonder he always talked about this it's a man has to be overcome. Man has to be overcome. He's talking about himself a lot of times. Well, most most philosophers, you could say that most of them do that, but uh, never recovered. Yes, uh, yeah, he collapsed January eighteen eighty nine. This famous collapse in Turin with the horse. I'm not totally sure if it's a legend actually. 
uh, Walter Kaufman talks about it as if it's not a legend in uh, Nietzsche bi- in his biography about Nietzsche. Nietzsche philo- it's called Nietzsche Philosopher Psychologist Antichrist. <clears throat> and his last work is actually one to me it's one of my favorite is are actually Antichrist and Twilight of the Idols. The, the last ones. Uh, this is where he had a lot of you know last but you can also see maybe a little bit of his you know craziness lunacy there kind of losing his mind a little bit but that's not here and that's not in Zarathustra or day science uh, you know but he is very of course you know kind of spiritual in a lot of ways uh, but when I say spiritual I'm not talking about metaphysics uh, a lot of heights a lot of talk hello uh, purple gesture uh, we're gonna read Nietzsche today <laughs> so human all to human so I talked about uh, last time you know well last time I read Nietzsche was on time limitation but here we get more Nietzsche in here and he gets more sick here as well he, he uh, sickness just becomes unbearable. He can't be a professor anymore in, at Basel University. So he leaves that. And 1879, this is kind of released around there, 79. And, uh, but it, it's actually, he added to this book, actually, Human All to Human. All, uh, human All to Human, yeah. a book for, the free, for free spirits. And so, yeah, this is a little bit earlier Nietzsche. Well, earlier. I mean, this is the kind of beginning of the whole aphoristic style here. Uh, you know, small moments like that. But that's because of the migraine, probably. Uh, a lot of... He couldn't write um, normally anymore. Uh, like he normally would have otherwise. Uh, so I see new picks are available. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just chose three one three three of these. Um, I included Rousseau uh, just because I don't know, uh, just to try something else there and see what happens. But I, I picked Nietzsche again because uh, I think Nietzsche is kind of popular. So, uh, but he wasn't popular at the time here. This book didn't actually sell much at all. Uh, even still today, human all to human is not the most read Nietzsche. It's probably gay science, genealogy of morals, Zarathustra. Oh yeah, beyond God, good and evil, of course. Uh, maybe beyond good and evil has become the more uh, popular. But to me, it's actually Antichrist and Twilight of the Idols. But also Zarath. I mean, I love all of them. But uh, yeah, actually more. I mean, towards here. You know. I voted for Rousseau. I know I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Maybe we'll get to Rousseau. It's actually not that long either. So I was thinking of maybe I should do these shorter ones. So we can try, you know, we jump around a little bit with the philosophers. It's a little bit of politics there, but, uh, you know, it's going to be in general terms and stuff like that because. Uh, He's going to talk about rights and stuff like that. But we'll, I don't know. Uh, yeah, but any, anyway, uh, I'm going to read Nietzsche here now. And um, yeah, the, here we'll, he's probably going to have more of an enlightenment. Uh, it's not enlight. it's still Nietzsche, but he's going to have this kind of, uh, you know, He's distancing himself from Bagno, Richard Bagno, and uh, he's distancing himself increasingly also from Schopenhauer. But Wagner especially was a, you know, he was like a father to him, and um, because he lost his father when he was like four, four years old, he never had a father, basically. And um, so yeah, uh, but he's increasingly sick as well. So the style kind of it reflects this, of course, and the thoughts as well, of course. But he's kind of freer now, and uh, and this is where you know the perspectives, and he'll he'll go all sorts of places now. So this is the first where he has this aphoristic style, like I said. Uh, so, but I'm gonna first read about the the 
I'm going to read the preface first. Volume 1, there is the second volume is... Uh, well, it says here... Uh, Wonder and His Shadow, and uh, what else was it? He added that later, a couple of years later, kind of, I think, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be... The preface is like this, all right? So preface... I mean, volume one, preface of the first and last things on the history of the moral sensations, um, the religious life. So it's a kind of a bunch of things here. From the souls of artists and writers, tokens of higher and lower culture, man in society, woman and child, a glance at the state. So we're going to get a little bit of politics here. Man alone with himself, among friends, an epilogue. And volume two, this came later. Assorted, so we try to put in here assorted opinions and maxims and the wonder and his shadow. But this book wasn't popular. Uh, Nietzsche is popular today, but he wasn't popular when he was, you know, sane. Then he went insane, 1889, Turin, January. And uh, he, uh, you know, uh, he had no idea about his, he was increasingly becoming popular because of the Dan this Danish uh, lecture and uh, but uh, yeah it was spreading kind of and then of course you know the Nazis and all that stuff also thanks to his sister all that you know uh, and but th there are these letters that, you can see this in Walter Kaufman's biography about him, uh, kind of the famous book that turned, uh, it was actually Walter Kaufman's book that changed the whole, our, our perspective on Nietzsche in, in terms of, you know, in the Anglosphere, so to speak, in the West. Um, well, especially Anglosphere, because in France, he was kind of better received, even, even during the World War, you know, after World War. But then after the World War, uh, Second World War. Um, Walter Kaufman, you know, he explained why Nietzsche is actually a great thinker, he, why, why he's worthwhile studying and, and, you know, for scholars. And, and uh, yeah, he himself became increasingly more and more, you know, he loved the books and increasingly loved them and, and be became influenced by him. But, uh, yeah, uh, but Kaufman is one of the best, you know, English tra translators and... This is by Hollingdale, but Hollingdale is also uh, the best, you know. So it's uh, Hollingdale, R.J. Hollingdale and uh, Kaufman, when it comes to English in, in, for, you know, Nietzsche. Uh, I wish I could, I could probably learn German pretty quickly because, you know, I can speak Swedish, but um, I kind of want to do that at some point um, because I want to read a Nietzsche as he is. Uh, but you know, you still get the ideas here. Uh, so, and and they and Hollingdale and um, well, Kaufman, they always try to preserve this. Uh, you know his style. Uh, so yeah, because he was such a great uh, literary person as well. So uh, anyway, so let let let's get to the preface here. So it's Nietzsche's words preface here. I'm not reading the translator's stuff here. Um, all right, preface. One, I've been told often enough and always with an expression of great surprise that all my writings from the birth of tragedy, so the first book he ever made, well, book, book, you know, like a proper book, to the most recently published prelude to a philosophy of the future. All right, so Prelude to a Philosophy of the Future, the subtitle of Beyond Good and Evil, published in 86. That's later. Birth of Tragedy, first published book, yes, 1872. Yeah. Uh, it took a couple of years until he published, you know, Untimely Meditations. And then this. Uh, it took him maybe, like, six, well, five years, six years uh, between there. So yeah, because uh, 1876, I think, Untimely Meditations. Although uh, sometimes these essays were published beforehand and then, you know, put into a book like that. 
Um, so it's not really how you know they got it first, but but like I said before, none of this was actually popular at all. He uh, didn't sell a lot of books, so he lived around places now, you know, uh, these small like hotels and stuff like that, and and um, he went to Sw Switzerland, Rapolo, Italy, and you know he wrote Zarathustra in Rapolo, in uh, close to uh, Portofino as well. It's a beautiful place. I've never been there, but I've seen that it's uh, very beautiful. I've been in Italy, Italy but not there. Uh, I've been in Venice, Milano. Uh, yeah, but anyway, so. Let's continue here. Recently published Prelude to a Philosophy of the Future. I have something that distinguishes them. So this is the preface. So he wrote this preface afterwards, a couple of years well, this is years after, yeah, because this book came out kind of, you know, 79 first came out. Then he added, you know, that wonder in the shadow. But so he writes this like 85, 86, right? Because, you know, he's talking about prelude to a philosophy of future, which is beyond good and evil. Um, have, uh, so let me read that. To the most recently published prelude, uh, have something that distinguishes and unites them together, all these. The, they, all of them, I have been given to understand, contain snares and nets for unwary birds, and in effect a persistent invitation to the overturning of habitual evaluations and valued habits. So, Nietzsche is all about, you know, re-evaluation of everything, but this kind of co comes later. Uh, we're not there yet. That's actually, Antichrist was actually the first book in terms of he actually left the will to power idea, uh, not the idea itself, uh, the the book, uh, and and so he, his his history is was also you know that also didn't make sense in, in terms of his his progress, and also when we look at Nietzsche, like this is on the way of becoming more and more mature Nietzsche, so this is kind of the aphoristic start here, although of course he made a lot of notes and stuff like that before. All of this as well, you know, walking around there in mountains, taking notes. He walked like six to eight hours a day, so he didn't sleep much either. Anyway, and value habits. All right, what, what? Everything only human, all too human. It is with this sigh that one emerges from my writings, not without a kind of reserve and mistrust, even in regard to morality. Not a little tempted and emboldened, indeed, for once to play the advocate of the worst things, as though they have perhaps been only the worst slandered. My writings have been called a schooling in suspicion, even more in contempt, but fortunately also in courage, indeed in audacity. And that's very much true. And in fact, I myself do not believe that anyone has ever before looked into the world with an equally profound degree of suspicion, and not merely as an occasion, occasional devil's advocate, but to speak theologically just as much as an enemy and indicter of God. <laughs> theologically. And anyone who could divine something of the consequences that lie in the profound suspiciousness, something of the fears and frosts of the isolation to which the unconditional disparity of view condemns him who is infected with it, will also understand how often, in an effort to recover from himself, as it were, to induce a temporary self-forgetting. We're already in this Nietzschean stuff here. Self-forgetting as well. He had a little bit of this in Untimely. Untimely is this coming of this. That is true. He said that himself, but it's very true. I've sought shelter in this or that, in some piece of admiration or enmity or scientificality or frivol frivolity or stupidity, <laughs> and why, where I could not find what I needed, emphasis needed, I had artificial to enforce, falsify, and invent a suitable fiction for myself. And what else have poets ever done? And to what end does art exist in the world at all? He was a poet as well, by the way. So yeah, that's why I call him, you know, uh, he's the ultimate to me, ultimate artist philosopher, basically. 
although a little bit more leaning to, to philosopher. And my, my favorite filmmaker, Andrei Tarkovsky, to me, he is more of the artist philosopher. So maybe Nietzsche is the philosophy artist and Tarkovsky is the artist philosopher. <laughs> anyway, so although, yeah, he's a bit more of a philosopher. Uh, and to what end does art exist in the world at all? So we'll get, probably get to that. What I again and again needed most for my cure and self-restoration, however, was the belief that I was not thus isolated, not alone in seeing as I did, an enchanted surmising of relatedness and identity in, the, uh, in I and desires, a reposing, in th uh, a reposing in trust of friendship, a blindness in concert with another without suspicion or question marks, a pleasure in foregrounds, surfaces, things close and closest, in everything possessing color, skin, and apparitionality. apparitionality. Perhaps in this regard, I might be reproached with having employed a certain amount of art, a certain amount of false coinage. For example, that I know, knowingly, willfully closed my eyes before Schopenhauer's blind will to mortal no, <laughs> blind will to morality. That I knowingly, willfully closed my eyes before Schopenhauer's blind will to morality at a time when I was already sufficiently clear-sighted about morality. Likewise, that I deceived myself over Richard Wagner's incurable romanticism, as though I were beginning and not, as though it was were a beginning and not an end. Likewise, over the Greeks, likewise over the Germans and their future, and perhaps a whole long list could be made made of such likewisesness. No, made of such likewises. So you got a lot of you know he's distancing from these people. He, he even, and Wagner died, like, uh, not actually long after this, if I remember correctly. Um, well, once he died, he did put, uh, in, the, in the first version of this, he put Voltaire's, uh, like a quote and dedication to Voltaire. Uh, but he, he removed that, I think, uh, after. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, anyway. Germans and their future, and perhaps a whole long list could be made of such likewises. Supposing, however, that all this were true and that I was reproached with it with good reason, what do you know, what could you know of how much cunning in self-preservation, how much reason and higher safeguarding is contained in such self-deception, or of how much falsity I shall require if I'm to continue to permit myself the luxury of my truthfulness. Enough, I'm still living. Enough, I'm still living. And life is, after all, not a product of morality. It wants deception. It lives on deception. But there you are. I'm already off again. And I'm not, and doing what I've always done, old immoralist and bird catcher that I am, speaking unmorally, extra-morally, beyond good and evil. You know, that, that's the thing, you know, it's beyond good and evil. <laughs> it's not good and evil. It's not, that's not what it is. It's beyond good and evil. It's actually speaking from the perspective of life, actually. That's the thing. A lot of people don't understand this, I think. Second here, and this is still the preface. So already we get his a sense of his you know, thinking, actually, uh, because he emphasizes life. He already does that. Well, actually, the preface is a bit afterward, so we got to remember that we're still not there yet, but we're kind of there still. I mean, he already in Untimely Meditations, he talked about history for life. So you already have it there. So that's, uh, yeah. But there is a lot of here immoralist. Uh, I love the bird catcher there. Um, my truthfulness. And he's talking about this way of perspectivism uh, and what life really wants. And, you know, that, that's the beauty of Nietzsche. Like, it wants deception. It lives on deception. I mean, saying it like that, um, he has this, uh, I don't know, it's so beauty, beautiful. Not just beautiful, but it's it's uh, 
a lot of ways it will be contrary to what you, you know, you don't, you don't want those words together, you know, like wants deception, lives on deception. You know? People don't want to hear this, but he says things that you should hear because the, the, there, is a, there is something good in this contrarian music. Uh, and also a lot of it comes from this unhealthiness that, you know, his, his body was, you know, deteriorating. But he overcame it, you know, that's why he talks about overcoming, mainly talking to himself, you know, managed to be overcome. He even said, said it somewhere, I needed it the most, he says, this overcoming. Anyway, second here, thus, when I needed to, needed to, I once also invented for myself the free spirits. So he was lonely a lot as well, by the way. So that's why he, he kind of needed these people of the future, the disciples. He wanted Lou Salome to be, or Saint Salome, he wanted her to be his, you know, uh, he had Peter Gast, uh, Hein, Heinrich, 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 Heinrich. Um, he had this assistant basically, but he was too much of a, you know, just parroting and, and, and so forth. He wanted, he wanted a disciple that would continue from their own, not, not just being a, you know, copier like that. He actually mentions this in a couple of letters. Uh, so yeah, uh, there is a lot of stuff like that. Um, anyway, so, uh, but he was lonely a lot. So, so it explains here, it explains why I invented for myself the free spirits to whom this melancholy valiant book with the title human all too human is dedicated. Free spirits of this kind do not exist, did not exist. But as I've said, I had need of them at that time. Uh, I had need of them at that time if I was to keep in good spirits while surrounded by ills, sickness, solitude, unfamiliar places, acadia or acedia, uh, inactivity, you know, laying, laying in bed and not being able to do anything basically a lot of the time. As brave companions and familiars with whom one can laugh and chatter when one feels like laughing and chattering and whom one can send to the devil when they become tedious as compensation for the friends I lacked. He had Paul Rey and uh, Louis Salome, but they, they, uh, they kind of, you know, that just went away. He had, fr he had a friend, Ovelbeck, from his childhood that he used to always write to, and they were friends until the end, but uh, yeah. Uh, he even helped afterwards in, in, uh, in the beginning in terms of him collapsing and all that stuff, going to doctors and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, um, there is a bunch of interesting stuff there as well. I wish we had a movie. Uh, I kind of want to write a screenplay or something of, of his life or something just to, we, we need kind of need a movie uh, with Nietzsche. Uh, would be interesting. Anyway, and he's kind of, you know, popular. He's not that, you know, he's popular today. He wasn't at the time, but he's kind of popular today, I would say. The friends I liked, all right. That free spirits of this kind could one day exist. That uh, This is also what he says in Zarathustra, you know. My future, in the future, you know. And this, that's actually after this, so. Although, yeah, like I said, preface is after as well, so. And... Well, at the time of Beyond Good and Evil, so that means um, it's after Zarathustra. Also. A lot of his words and you know terminology develops here. Uh, he carries on a couple of things, but um, you know the whole four life, Dionysius and Apollonian. He kind of drops it, but he still uses it actually. Uh, that which is from Birth and um, uh, of Tragedy. Birth of, tra birth of tra tragedy, um, and he and also he's moving increasingly into philosophy instead of philology, and and uh, you know, of course he, it is about social and and other sort of, it's also psychological, increasingly psychological. He discovers uh, Dostoevsky, but that's a little bit later, I, I believe. Uh, I love Dostoevsky as well. So anyway. That free spirits of this kind could one day exist 
that our Europe will have such, a, you see, our Europe, it has this, you know, pan, pan-European idea. It feels like a European. It doesn't feel like, oh, I'm a German, you know. Uh, that, and he even said it at the end, he, you know, basically hated the Germans, although he always talked about not resenting, but uh, he, he claimed to be a Polish. <laughs> but that's not true. Uh, as far as people know, but uh, that free spirits of this kind could one day exist, that our Europe will have such active and audacious fellow fellows among its sons of tomorrow and the next day. And you know, contrarians against the whole establishment, establishment and everything. Physically present and palpable and not, as in my case, merely phantoms and hermits, phantasmagoria. <laughs> yeah. It's not just going to be phantoms, it's actually going to be present and palpable and real people. I should wish to be the last to doubt it. I see them already coming, slowly, slowly, and perhaps I shall do something to speed their coming if I describe in advance under what uh, vicissitude, uh, vici vicissitudes uh, upon what paths I see them coming. Three. One may conjecture that a spirit in whom the type free spirit will one day become ripe and sweet to the point of perfection has had its decisive experience in a great liberation and that previously it had all the more a fettered spirit and it seems to be chained for forever to its pillar and corner. I wonder what he would have thought about the existentialist. A lot of people see him as the first, you know, like a kind of a father of it. Well, even though Kierkegaard is also this, but he's a little bit there later. But, yeah. But I, I wouldn't put him in anything. He's his own thing. That's the thing. He's, he, you, you can't really put him anywhere. Uh, well, you can, but uh, not in that sense. One may conjecture... Uh, let me see here. Pillar and corner. What, fet what fetters, uh, fetters uh, the fastest? What bonds are all but unbreakable? In the case of men of high and select kind, they will be their duties, that reverence proper to youth, that reserve and delicacy before all that is honored and revered from, the, from of old, that gratitude for the soil out of which they have grown, you know, but he's not talking about literally, uh, he's not talking about nation here, you know. That's the thing about Nietzsche, you can easily misunderstand it. He even uh, admitted this himself, I think. Uh, and he knew that a lot of anti-Semites began to like his stuff, and, and um, but he went against that. And, and really clear as well. He said it was important to him to be clear there. For the hand which led them, for the holy place where they learned to worship, their supreme moment, and he, he didn't want himself to be worshipped you know, in that sense, that's not really what he says here. Or at least that's something he drops. But for the holy place, it's place. So where they learn to worship, their supreme moments themselves will fetter them the fastest. Lay upon them the most enduring obligation, which is breaking of, of your idols, you know, which is exactly doing it. The great liberation comes for those who are thus fettered suddenly, like the shock of an earthquake. The youthful soul is all at once convulsed torn loose, torn away. It itself does not know what is happening. A drive and impulse rules and masters it like a command. A will, a will and desire awakens to go off, anywhere, at any cost, a vehement, dangerous curiosity for an undiscovered world flames and flickers in all its senses. It's beautifully written like that. Better to die than to go on living here, thus responds the imperious voice and temptation and this here this at home is everything it had hitherto loved hitherto loved a sudden terror and suspicion of what it loved a lightning bolt of contempt for what it called duty a rebellious ar arbitrary volcanically erupting desire for travel strange places estrangements coldness soberness frost a hatred of love perhaps a, a desecrating blow and glance backwards to where it formerly loved and worshipped. 
you see? Perhaps a hot blush of shame at what it has just done, and at the same time an exultation, exultation that, that it has done it, a drunken, inwardly exultant shudder, which betrays that, that a victory has been won. A victory? Over what? Over whom? An enigmatic, question-packed, questionable victory, but the first victory nonetheless. He also had this, yeah, like, like he said also himself here, but he sees them coming. Like he thought that it was going to happen actually in his time and, or right after, like not right after, in his time. He, he was seeing it coming kind of, but, uh, but yeah. But the first victory nonetheless, such bad and painful things are part of the history of the great liberation. That's the thing, he kind of wants this, you know, the Renaissance to happen again, but not the Renaissance itself, but a, a new one. And that's also kind of the whole reevaluation of everything, you know, realizing that we have to reevaluate everything. All of this is human, the whole human nature. That's why it is human all to human as well. It is at the same time a sickness that can, but it becomes something more than this at the end of this. Well, you know, Antichrist and later. It is at the same time a sickness that can destroy the man who has it. This first outbreak of strength and will to self-determination, to evaluating on one's own account, that's you know part of this, you know, independence here, self-dependence. This will this will to free will. And how much sickness is expressed in the will wild experiments and singularities through which the liberated prisoner now seeks to demonstrate his mastery over things. He prowls cruelly around with an unslake uh, le uh, lasciviousness. Uh, uh, what he captures, uh, le lascivious, lasciviousness, uh, what he captures has to ex expiate the perilous tension, the perilous tension of his pride. What he captures has to ex expiate uh, the perilous tension of his pride. What excites him, he tears, tears apart. With a wicked laugh, he turns around whatever he finds veiled and through some sense of shame or other spared and pampered, he puts to test what these things look when they are reversed. It is an act of willfulness and pleasure in willfulness. I won't like playing around here. If now he perhaps bestow, bestows his favor on that which he has hitherto ha had a bad reputation. If, full of inquisitiveness, uh, the desire and, des and the desire to tempt an experiment, he creeps around the things most forbidden. Behind all this toiling and weaving, for he is restlessly and aimlessly on his way as if in a desert, stands the question mark of a more and more perilous curiosity. Can all values not be turned around? There you go. And is good perhaps evil? That's the thing with Nietzsche here. Is good perhaps evil? No. <laughs> and God only an invention and finesse of the devil? Is everything perhaps in the last res resort false? And if we are deceived, are we... <laughs> that's a little bit the cow there. And if we are deceived, are we not for that very reason also deceivers? So it's more than that, you know, it's like we are the deceivers as well. Must, and also like cosmos is, cosmos deceiving us. Must we not be deceivers? Such thoughts as these tempt him to lead him on, even further away, even further down. Solitude encircles and embraces him, ever more threatening, suffocating, heart tightening, that, that terrible goddess and mater saeva cupidinum. Mat, mater saeva, mater is uh, ma mother. Right, uh, I don't even have to look at that, but Mater Saeva Cupidinum, cu cupidinum uh, Wild Mother of the Passions. All right, Mater Saeva Cupidinum, but who today knows what solitude is? But who today knows what solitude is? Uh, I'm pretty sure I know what solitude is, but yeah, but at the time, you know. Uh, four here. We kind of have increased solitude today, I guess. So maybe that's why a lot of people kind of find, um, you know, 
uh, a lot of you know relatability here. Although it's not just about relatability, it's more than this. You know, it, it's almost like a fire inspiration. You know, fire. You know, going through you. Four, from this morbid isolation, from the desert of these. It's not like it was easy. You know, it's not easy. From this morbid isolation, from the desert of these years of temptation and experiment, it is still a long road to that tremendous overflowing certainty and health which may not dispense even with wickedness, as a means and fish hook of knowledge to that mature freedom of spirit, which is equally self-mastering discipline of the heart and permits access to many and contradictory modes of thought. Yeah, he had to be disciplined, otherwise none of this would have even existed. To that inner spaciousness in indulgence of superabundance, which excludes the danger that the spirit may even on its own road perhaps lose itself and become infatuated and remain seated intoxicated in some corner or other. To that superfluity, superfluity of formative, curative, molding and restorative forces, which is precisely the sign of great health. Great health. That superfluity which grants to the free spirit the dangerous privilege of living experimentally and of being allowed to offer itself to adventure, the master's privilege of the free spirit. In between there may lie long years of convalescence, years of full of uh, variegated, years full of variegated, painfully magical transformation, ruled and led along by a tenacious will to health, which often ventures to clothe and disguise itself as health already achieved. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. There is a midway condition which a man of such a destiny will not be able to recall without emotion. And also, a lot of this is based on, you know, it's all experience here. It's talking from experience. Here. And, and his philosophy is tied to this experience. So you gotta, you know, dwell within yourself to really understand each other. There is a midway condition which a man of such a destiny will not be able to recall without emotion. It is characterized by pale, subtle happiness of light and sunshine, a feeling of bird-like freedom, bird-like altitude, bird-like exuberance, and a third thing in which curiosity is united with a tender contempt. A free spirit, this cool expression, does, not, does one good in every condition. It is almost warming. One lives no longer in the fetters of love and hatred, without a yes, without no, near or far as one wishes, preferably slipping away, evading, fluttering off, gone again, again flying aloft. One is spoiled, as everyone who is, as everyone is who has at some time been a tremendous number of things beneath him. And one, and there you go, ben, the beneath thing here. You'll see this later. Well, you know, it's still the preface, right? So this is the later. <laughs> so you see that later on, that, that will be neat. And one becomes the opposite of those who concern themselves with things which have nothing to do with them. Indeed, the free spirits henceforth has to do only with things and how many things with which he is no longer concerned. Exactly, so it's from experience. Five here. A step further in convalescence, and the free spirit again draws near to life, <clears throat> draws near to life. Slowly to be sure, almost reluctantly, almost mistrustfully, it again grows warmer around him, yellower as it were, feeling and feeling for others acquire depth. Warm breezes of all kinds, of all kind blow across him. It seems to him as if his eyes are only now open to what is close at hand. He also plays with words a lot, by the way. Probably it makes much more sense in, uh, in uh, German. He is astonished and sits silent. Where, where had he been? These close and closest things, how changed they seem, what bloom and magic they have acquired. He looks back gratefully, grateful to his wandering, to his hardness and self-alienation to his viewing of far distances and bird-like flights in cold heights. 
What a good thing he had not always stayed at home, stayed under his own roof, like a delicate, apathetic loafer. <laughs> Uh, he had been beside himself, no doubt about that. Only now does he see himself, and what surprises he experiences as he do, does so. What, unprecedent, what, what unprecedented shudders. What happiness, even in the weariness, the old sickness, the relapses of convalescence, convalescent, of the convalescent. How he loves to sit sadly still, to spin out patience, to lie in the sun. Who understands as he does the happiness that comes in winter, the spots of sunlight on the wall? There are the most grateful animals in the world, the free spirits. Also the most modest, these convalescents and the lizards again have turned towards life. The lizards. There are some among them who allow no day to pass without hanging a little song of praise on the hem of its departing robe. And to speak seriously, to become sick in the manner of these free spirits, to remain sick for a long time and then slowly, slowly to become healthy, by which I mean healthier, is a fundamental cure for all pessimism. You see, it's not about pessimism. He's also, you know, moving away from pessimistic Schopenhauer. The cancerous sore and inveterate vice, and also he saw this in Christianity, inveterate vice, as it is well known, of old idealists and inveterate liars. There is wisdom, practical wisdom, in for a long time prescribing even health for oneself in small doses. Let's continue here. Six here. At that time, it may finally happen that, under the sudden elimination of a, a still stressful, still changeable health, the free, even freer spirit begins to unveil the riddle of that great liberation, which had until then waited dark, questionable, almost untouchable in his memory. If he, had, if he has for long hardly dared to ask himself, why so apart, so alone, renouncing everything I once re re reverenced, renouncing everything I once reverenced, renouncing reverence itself, why this hardness, this suspiciousness, this hatred for your own virtues? Now, uh, now he dares to ask it aloud and hears in reply something like an answer. You shall become master over yourself, master also over your virtues. You shall become master. Uh, formerly, they were your masters, but they must be only your instruments beside other instruments. Exactly. You shall get control over your for and against and learn how to display First one and then the other in accordance with your higher goal. Exactly. I mean, that's a great way of explaining this. This is the whole perspectivism here. That's why also he says, you know, I wrote, he wrote Zarathustra. There was a lot of yes saying there, a lot of for there. And then he made Beyond Good and Evil. It's a lot of against, a lot of no, no saying. I think he says that a lot, well, in the beginning of Beyond Good and Evil. Uh, higher goal, right? You shall learn, so the higher goal is always, you know, overcoming oneself. You shall learn to grasp the sense of perspective in every value judgment. The displacement value judgment there. In every value judgment. The displacement, distortion, and merely apparent teleology uh, of horizons and whatever else pertains to perspectivism. There you go. Also the quantum of... <laughs> the quantum. Also the quantum of...